it. Okay, ready to start? Let's go. All right, Peter, the floor is yours. Thanks, Meryl. Um, Mark, I think you've got the slides, so can we, um, yeah, move through to, um, to my first slide, please? Fab. And on to the next one. So um, I think I'm right in saying that we've got five minutes, so I'll stick to that. Um, my role within the Ways of Working team at Nationwide Building Society is to provide support guidance in terms of how we develop our offering. Um, and I just want to spend five minutes talking about how we created a Ways of Working team and some of the lessons that we've learned so far. So, um, Mark, if you wouldn't mind. So there's kind of three parts to this. The first is how you kind of envisage this journey. Um, you have this belief that there is a very logical reason for changing your ways of working to become agile, to provide true business agility, which isn't just about adopting frameworks. It's not about swapping one set of systems and processes for another. It's actually about saying there's a great opportunity for improvement, for, for changing the way that we work. And it's based in our case on a belief that we can resolve some long-standing issues which have bothered colleagues and have meant that we haven't been as effective as we want to be in terms of delivering value to our members. And our members own our society. We have 15 million members. We don't have shareholders, they own our business. So you have this belief that it's gonna make everything better. And so you start with this strong, courageous belief system and you want to drive change for your organization and you want to take people with you. But actually, if we move on, Mark, to the next bit, what tends to happen is that what colleagues experience is this kind of foggy vision of the road ahead. It's not clear to them why they should engage with this. And they start to have things like, yeah, okay, this can, might, might look better, but you need to prove it to me. Um, it particularly starts to impact people individually to say, oh, I'm not quite sure how I fit into this. I need you to show me the role that I'm going to play. I need to see some role model behaviors. I need to understand what changes for me individually. And that leads into, you know, what is agility? What is it? What is it you're talking about? How do we bring it to life? How do we visualize it? So within Nationwide, we've spent a lot of time supporting people. We have enablement specialists who sit with colleagues and try and demonstrate different ways of working. We bring in external organizations who've gone on this journey already. And we open and very transparently share our experience. We share what's worked, what hasn't worked. And the final point there is people are really busy, right? You know, like any organization, we're trying to get a lot done all at the same time. So you have to try and simplify the approach, have to try and break it down. So um, how it then sort of tends to feel is actually like you're wading through a lot of tree and a lot of mud. So how do you just keep going? Well, firstly, you need to celebrate even the very smallest steps through this muddy field. You need to keep sharing. You need to celebrate the learning. You need to be transparent and open, especially with failure. You know, you need to show people that this isn't some con story around perfection. This is actually about changing the way that you work, changing the way you learn in order to be able to create psychological safety to be able to move forwards. We try and stay curious. So an event like this is great because we know that we'll get good questions coming in to us, which will test our understanding and it enables us to connect with people. You need to have fun because it's a, it's a difficult, sticky journey and just keep moving, you know, no matter how sticky the mud is. So um, moving on, what, what do we actually do then? What was the work that we did? So first up, we, we agreed a set of principles, how we are going to work together. It's deliberately small, not because we're hiding it, and I'm sure we can share this um, later after the call, but we set a set of values and principles that we wanted to work by, which were right for us, which were designed in a way um, that fitted with our organisation, fitted with the culture of our organisation, but were based around the principles of agility. But they weren't taken straight from a textbook, they weren't lifted and dropped, they were right for us. The next thing that we did was we agreed that we need to work collaboratively across the organization and recognize that as a ways of working enablement team, it's our job to serve others. So this isn't about us turning up as a central function and telling people how to work. It's actually about understanding what the problems are that prevent value from being delivered to our members. And then working with the colleagues who are working to deliver that and trying to understand how we can help in the system. Um, 
We then start with direction, and it won't be any surprise to anybody that we set our direction based around understanding what the vision is, a roadmap, and then using OKRs to try and define outcomes for the organisation. That in its own right has been a really interesting journey, and Kim's going to talk to you about that later on within this lightning chat. And then finally, um, we've created an easy way for people to access the information. So Teams has been great for us, um, setting up and using things like Confluence has been brilliant in order just to share very openly information, um, the ability for people to access learning, access experiences, access materials that can help them. So that's my five minutes, that's my snapshot, and I'll hand over now to Mel. Thanks, Peter. So, hi everyone. Um, I'm part of the Ways of Working team within Nationwide Building Society, and I've been working alongside a small team over the last year to build, experiment, and now implement intelligent control, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today, including how we're using the new way of working to deliver safer value. Next slide, please. So intelligent control is a collaborative approach for embedding control within the work that we do. It helps ensure our products and services are safe, keeping our members and colleagues safe and delivering what we call safer value. So we ensure that when we deliver value, whether it be better quality products, delivering quicker, reducing cost or keeping our members happy, we know we've delivered that value safely. And this involves understanding our risk as early as possible and assigning the right control capabilities to the right work at the right time. So what we're looking to do is move away from fully discrete and separate control compliance processes, which can be quite confusing and complicated from the customer's point of view. For example, multiple points of engagement, multiple assessments to complete, lots of different processes to follow, lots of duplication. Instead, intelligent control aims to drive a consistent standard and understanding of risk across the society, enabling confidence in our risk position and knowing that the right controls are being implemented to mitigate risk. And it really simplifies this process and achieves what we call minimum viable control. So the minimum amount of controls required and also minimum viable governance. So the minimum amount of approvals for those controls or governance meetings that need to take place, for example. And it can also achieve this through leveraging agile ways of working. So controls can be embedded into incremental development cycles, allowing high release frequencies and quicker response to market and regulatory change. So I've included at the bottom of this slide a simple diagram of the intelligent control cycle that we are implementing. And I'm going to focus now on three key parts to the intelligent control approach that help us to achieve better value sooner, safer and happier. And I've starred these in the diagram, but there are other parts of the approach that also contribute. So firstly, the Unified Risk Assessment or the URA as we call it in short. This introduces one single assessment, which is a combination of all the risk assessments that we may have to complete which immediately simplifies the interface that we have with control teams. It's completed on one objective or OKR right at the start. And because the intelligent control approach leverages agile ways of working, the unified risk assessment can be revisited throughout the life of that objective as and when more information is available. Or for example, if something changes, which requires the risk to be reassessed. And the unified risk assessment removes confusion of having multiple assessments, multiple processes, duplication of questions and potentially the chance of missing something which makes our internal customers happier as the whole process is much simpler and quicker and it removes any risk of not identifying controls early on that's helping to ensure our releases are safer and minimum rework is required. The second key part of the approach is collaboration so the very first set of questions in the unified risk assessment identify which control areas are relevant for the objective and they are then assigned a control SME from each of those identified areas. And all of the control SMEs from the different control areas together are called a safety team. And the safety team work with the team who are delivering the objective, for example, the product team, on a highly collaborative basis throughout the objective to identify the minimum set of controls appropriate to keep members and the society safe and to get the thing that they're looking to deliver finished as quickly and safely as possible. And the third key part of the intelligent control approach is where I come in. So my outcome has been to provide improved visibility and traceability of our controls and risk position, enabling quicker identification of impediments to flow and enabling better informed decisions that help keep the society safe. So achieving value through our data. So what we have um, is a process as per the bottom of the slide from left to right, where the teams complete the URA for an objective. This tells you which controls as a minimum that are required to deliver that objective safely. And for each of those controls, we've created control stories in JIRA, which are like user stories, but are actionable control requirements. 
and they each have acceptance criteria. The required control stories are then added to the team's backlogs in JIRA to be assigned to a release and delivered by the team like any other user story um, in incremental development cycles with the support of the safety team. So the fields within those controls, uh, control stories in JIRA are fed through to ThoughtSpot, which is one of our business intelligence tools. And this enables us to create automated pin boards with metrics which give teams improved visibility of their control stories and insight that will help them better manage their controls and any risks associated. Next slide, please, Mark. So this slide here just gives you an idea of some of the visuals that we've already built into our pin boards. And they've been extracted to this slide for external purposes. But in reality, the pin boards are interactive, which replaces the need for creating static reports where data is immediately out of date and you need to keep reproducing it. Um, instead, you have visuals that only need creating once and the data within it is updated automatically, currently daily, although we are looking to move to real time. You can drill down on the data for more information and it will even take you back to the source data, which helps to make better informed decisions and take action quickly. And as a result, we're expecting to have improved confidence within the society, knowing the status of all controls at any point in time. We can easily identify whether a block has to flow and look to move that forward quickly. We keep check that everything is as it should be from a controls perspective prior to releases being approved. We have that traceability all the way through from the risk being identified in the unified risk assessment to the controls being approved and the release being signed off. And what we're working on next is being able to automatically understand the risk position as a result of our control position and quickly see anything that we need to be concerned about. So just to say, we've been developing this approach over the course of the year. We ran our first experiment using our minimum viable product towards the end of last year in 2020. This was within product development and it proved to be a success. So we've started to implement this in other product teams too. We've had great customer feedback, not only on the positive impact this approach is making, particularly on the collaboration between the control SMEs and the product teams, and also the improved visibility with the pin boards, but also great feedback on how we develop the approach further. And we've been using this feedback to incrementally develop and continuously improve the approach. Um, and it's not been plain sailing at all. Um, we've come up against challenges, particularly as this is a change to the way people are used to doing things. And teams are quite naturally protective of their current processes too. So what we found is by keeping an open mindset, taking the time to understand their concerns and potential problems and working together to navigate through those problems, we've made great progress. Um, and development of the approach is not finished yet. There's so much more that we can do. Um, but due to the success of the experiment and subsequent implementations to date, we're already starting to implement this approach much wider as a way of working, which means we'll have more customers to help feed in ideas and we can continue to develop the approach together. Thank you. Um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was I'll roll straight in. Okay, it's, uh, it's Tony Kank here. Um, I'm, uh, my topic today is talking about communication, not in the whole sense of the word, but in particular conversation over a period of weeks with our, some of our senior stakeholders. So if we um, move on into, into the uh, slides, we'll see what has been happening for us. So the, the first thing in this conversation that happened that we thought was great was that ways of working was explicitly stated as a strategic priority. So that sort of top down mandate for improving ways of working across the society. And of course, we react like we, we all might if we're a change agent, we say, great, we've got a seat at the table, we're engaged with the very senior uh, stakeholders. Now, of course, many of the people we are engaged with are those that govern the investment you know, or the strategy for out for the whole society. So, you know, in the functions of strategy and finance and change, where uh, they're used to a certain way of working. So as soon as we were named as a strategic priority, next question was, can we see the plan, please? And we're like, well, here's how we here's how we approach that. We've got the levers that we're doing. We've got um, a backlog of work that's, you know, the activities around those three levers, organize the work, organize the people and speed up the work and various uh, initiatives quite an experimental uh, and data-led approach to that iterative delivery. We're quite pleased with ourselves. And here's the outcomes, very measurable flow, value, and culture with, with a suite of uh, measurable metrics behind those. So the, the immediate response to that question, hang on, we're going backwards instead of forwards, is can we see the plan with more detail? So that, that more detailed please is the question. What's meant by more detail, please? 
So our first thought, well, that doesn't sound safe. Someone wants a, uh, the, the traditional functions want a more detailed plan for how we're implementing um, the, our ways of working. So we thought to ourselves, well, first thing we'll do is we'll give them more chevrons. They want chevrons, here's chevrons. So we did a couple of slides worth of chevrons um, with lots of things written on there, all the activities, activities, activities that might be expected in those that like to see a plan. And um, the response from some on that was, thank you. Uh, others didn't read it at all because they sort of got that that's just an activity plan and that the outcomes are more important. But the activity, the, well, the, the effort, the, the tedious effort of pulling together the chevrons and having to ask everyone what they're up to so we can write it on their activity plan, that had some side benefits because we contacted lots of people and perhaps maybe when people ask us for a plan, really what that's what they're asking. Have you thought of everything that, or everyone, that you might need to engage to bring that together. So the three uh, levers that we showed on the on the previous slide with our structure for our work, we broke those down into the various components of, a, of things that are the interventions that we could be doing. And in the process identified many, many stakeholders and quite a few cross-functional teams that were necessary to, to explicitly bring together on ways of working itself. So um, that in itself was an interesting side benefit of the activity of going and gathering lots of chevrons. And you'll be pleased to know that the chevron slides didn't make the, uh, the cut for the final materials. So that was, that was a relief. But nonetheless, we'd met the needs of some people to see uh, uh, more detail, please. So but after that had happened, I, I sort of stopped. I was getting a bit cynical by now because it took a few weeks and a fair bit of overtime to, um, to achieve. Uh, as a couple of us on the call involved in that activity. So I thought, well, how can we have empathy for what's really being asked for? What's the common ground? Here and how can we think about it? So I'm thinking about it in terms of, I'm really explicitly and rather in a nerdy way here, referring to the Better Value Sooner, Safer, Happier book and the patterns within it. So I've quoted the page numbers there, you can look it up later. And there we are, we're being asked for a plan and you know, those of the agile mindset are probably sitting there going, look at that, we're being asked for a deterministic plan, we're being asked to apply deterministic you know, milestones and dates and so on to what is obviously a really complex domain. And probably if we are empathizing, you know, our resistance to providing a plan with that mindset gets a response of, well, they're probably just agile cowboys who don't want to be committed to anything. So where's the, where's the middle ground then that comes out of that? So I didn't say any of those things above in the thought bubbles. That was good. <laughs> what I did say was another pattern and, and said this to our stakeholders, which was about the pattern and one of the anti-patterns in the book, which is the headless chicken anti-pattern. And it's an actual anti-pattern of poor agility, more agility with poor discipline, where teams are just producing stuff, but they have no idea why, they have no measures of success and no real uh, you know, empirical rationale behind their prioritization, for example. So that anti-pattern was the one that we did speak about to say, well, in this transformation, we're not looking for agile cowboys, we are looking for um, self-disciplined teams and that was definitely agreed and well received as a, as a message. So then what what can we work on together? We looked at the pattern and this was this is to do with this, this assignment of work that I've got in my role is looking at the pattern for nested outcomes from straight from the book. Uh, nested OKRs if you like where we're coming from strategy and explicitly unpacking that all the way down to the team's backlogs and, and many of you will be familiar with that kind of pattern for, for lean portfolio management. Um, so we talk about that pattern to our, and of course we're talking in the audience here to those that fund this, that fund the strategy, that fund the strategic outcomes, that fund the, uh, the objectives and key results. And of course they're seeing it as a, as a traditional project funding kind of model. Um, but nonetheless, when we said, would you like to see that traceability all the way through, then they said, yes, please. So let's move on. Again, we said, well, how are we going to build that? And they said, can we see more on the plan? Let's, let's just keep moving through there. We looked at, on this slide here, we looked at a few more of the patterns, the S-curve itself of how we execute change, the fact that we want to do iterative and uh, experimental adoption. Clicking forward, yep. And also the fact that we would be using something like the, the coaching card on the organization. So with those positive patterns, how can we express a plan for building out the new ways of working in a way that's going to last a bit longer and not be such a 
sort of a last minute panic to produce Chevron. So a bit more empathy, a bit more thinking about these plans and the following slide is what we came up with. So this is my new little uh, hack that I'll be using next time I'm asked for more Chevrons, which is looking at the S curve as a set of Chevrons. So we're looking at the S curve of adoption, the, the uh, Everett Rogers model to say, well, first of all, we're going to experiment with some early adopters and then we'll evolve our models and our ways of working with an early majority, then we'll support the late majority. And we didn't, no one liked the word laggards, no one wants to be called that. So we, we changed the name to skeptics. And just that anchor to everything that we're communicating about plans and what are you doing has really helped to move things forward. So the, as, as those with an agile mindset, we can in good conscience and with full integrity, write some chevrons under this without feeling like we're telling fibs because we're not promising how many early adopters there will be, we've still got flexible scope but we are showing very explicitly our evolutionary approach to be able to uh, describe our, our ways of working going forward. And so then we get material like this is now appearing in our, uh, in our packs, even to our, into our, of course, it's all PowerPoint folks. Sorry about that. This is all PowerPoint. And in our material going to, to senior stakeholders, we are now using the S curve explicitly as a way to explain our roadmap and where we are up to with certain experimentation. The other, the other hack in here that's worked very well is to be very formal with the way we write up experiments, to write, the, write up the results of experiments, you know, almost like a scientific paper. We tried this, this was our hypothesis, this was where we were right, wrong, indifferent. And that formality, again, showing a self-discipline has helped to debunk the, the Agile Cowboys kind of uh, impression. So those, those are some of the hacks that I think I'll use again out of that, that activity of communicating with those that ask that question when we see the plan with more detail. That's it for me. Cool, thanks, Tony. So um, that was me controlling uh, Tony's slide, so I apologize for some of that stuff. It's kind of, <clears throat> it's quite amusing when someone's trying to talk about communicating and you're trying to read their mind <laughs> to work out when they want the slides moved on. So uh, yeah, sorry about some of that technical there. That. So, my name is Mark Brendel and I'm a consultant driving DevOps and Site Reliability Engineering or SRE uh, within Nationwide's uh, Ways of Working organization. And I'm going to share why we found it necessary to use experiments and then walk you through a journey from sort of bad pretend experiments through to what we found to be genuinely effective. So firstly, the problem space of where DevOps operates um, and why we need experiments. It would be lovely if the real world mapped onto a neat little infinity loop like, like this, right? And imagine through some value stream mapping, we could have a perfect view of the performance of the system and we could spot a bottleneck and we could kind of apply some kind of DevOps best practice and CICD or platform automation or control changes. And the bottleneck would be exploited or eliminated entirely and, and life would be good, right? But this, is, this isn't a physical production plant in the, uh, in the mid to late 20th century, as much as we love them. You know, this is knowledge work and um, it's much more variable. It's very much a, a socio-technical system. And even if we succeeded in optimizing one part of the system, well, the overall effect on agility and reliability and, uh, and business is gonna be, is gonna be very uh, unpredictable. And sadly, um, in reality, things don't really conform, especially well to the infinity loop. So, most of the systems that we're working with have got multiple teams, multiple loops, not to mention platforms and uh, security teams, risk and control teams. The, the true bottleneck and therefore what to focus on can be really much, much harder to find. Uh, this slide, by the way, uh, the, the bottles are talking about bottlenecks between teams, although it has been pointed out to me, it looks like uh, empty sort of drinks bottles and the output of some kind of epic office party. But no, this is about bottlenecks. So. Successful DevOps adoption and not just kind of cargo culting the implementation of popular ideas like CICD, it really has proved to need experimentation and an approach similar to the Kinevin framework um, or what the Kinevin framework would call a, a complex situation. So we have to probe and sense and respond. So in my experience, it doesn't take much effort these days to convince people that they should call their work experiments. Um, but it's, it's very easy to intend to do experiments uh, and, and not really end up doing them and effectively do something a bit like this. So we might form an idea in our context that teams should do something like CICD, continuous integration, um, and help implement it. And then infer that we've done it. And so, you know, the world must be better. But 
of course, you know, maybe it isn't better. Perhaps things aren't working out as we expected, either directly or or maybe indirectly. We've suboptimized something else in the system. So obviously, working like this, it isn't it isn't an experiment. So a slightly improved method might look like this. So form an idea that teams should do something like test automation and implementing it, and then paying very close attention to understand the outcome. So at least uh, this way we're informing our sort of future selves, our future ideas. Um, still not really experimenting though. So now to improve the idea a bit further still, we could apply some lean startup or MVP, minimum viable product type thinking. So forming an idea that teams should do something like trialing a, a new controls process and then figuring out the lowest effort and lowest risk approach to trying it. And then like last time, paying really close attention to the outcome uh, and this time getting there faster and, and more safely. But overall, I still don't consider this to be really experimentation. For me, experimentation has to be about reducing uncertainty and explicitly focusing on that. So finally, onto what um, something I actually do recommend to trying to emulate. So we start by recognizing that there's something that we don't know about our context, about our system, but we believe there'll be real value from knowing that. For example, we might want to know whether environment or test environment inconsistency could be having a major impact on, on delivery flow. So then we can evaluate the or anal analyze the value of this information might bring us. If we think it's justified, turn it into a hypothesis or a, a statement of something that we believe to be true. Uh, and then the work is to form an experiment to test this hypothesis. Can we prove or disprove it? And having properly run an experiment now, we can pay really close attention to whether we learned what we expected uh, and what else we learned. And, and we now understand the problem space much better. So we're far better equipped to make a valuable um, sort of decision about trying to achieve some sustainable change. So one example that we've had here, a team that we're, that we're working with, we're looking to release more regularly into production. And the value stream mapping that was performed sort of tended to, to put point towards maybe manual steps in code deployments um, that were the bottleneck. But in reality, when we thought hard about it, we, we really didn't know um, too much about exactly what was happening at release time and, and what the process was being fo followed. So we, we ran an experiment around that to review how changes were going in and how changes from other teams were going in. And this taught us that they're actually missing out from the benefits of using our templated or standard change types, which they were already eligible for using. So um, that was a much sort of shorter um, and simpler approach that we found out by, by looking at what we didn't know. And that, you know, that moved us on to thinking actually manual testing was an area to look at and, and, and experimenting with a new bottleneck. And of course, a sort of secondary benefit for this is that everyone could really, could sort of learn, you know, we worked really hard, as Peter said, on sharing um, that these learnings for other people and see whether things might work um, in their context. So, you know, this might all sound like common sense, and, and I think that's good. It is really, and um, it's not so much about agreeing whether, in theory, these are good ideas. That the hard part is actually consistently doing this in practice, uh, and that's why we found this template that you can see on the screen really useful for structuring good experiments, and why we're very, very grateful to a chap named Carl Scotland who first uh, shared a version of this at one of our agile meetups um, back when we were all working in Swindon, and. Um, Using this guides us to work really collaboratively as a team designing experiments and really pouring over every sentence and every word to get a sort of shared context. And it really tightens up our thinking around things like our shared understanding of the problem space and what we think we can actually influence and what we don't know and why we think these things and maybe even a sort of five whys type analysis of that. But most importantly, it reminds us to, to design plans up front for detecting how we're going to be successful, so proving uh, we, what we call a success, so proving the hypothesis, disproving the hypothesis, which is, of course, you know, a, um, a good thing to do as well, or actually, and this is important, whether we might fail to prove or disprove it. And that can happen a lot when you're starting off doing experiments and writing them, that you, know, you realise that you're not, you don't really have the, the experiment set up in a way that you can actually learn what you think you're going to learn. So you have to stop and, and redesign it. So there you go, um, experiments with uh, DevOps and SRE and hopefully uh, applicable in your context too. I am handing over to someone else now. Hello, I'm Kimberly Wilson okay. and I'm going to talk about the, our journey that we're on to really focus on value. So I'm sure a load of you recognise and if you just click through 
so recognize where we're coming from in our background um, on the slide before. Sorry, Mark. I've gone, you've got the worst task. There we go. Um, so I'm sure a load of you recognize where, we, where we've come from in our context. If we've had to really justify our experience, a focus on in these difficult times on how much do you, does your change cost, but also how much financial benefit are you bringing in? Which as we, we found doesn't always tell the whole story and can even be a little damaging when um, your main reason for some of the changes are non-financial because it distracts from your real reason of why you're making your change. So if you go on to the next screen, sorry, Mark. So what we've what we tried to take it back to is kind of bare bones. Let's talk about your real reason for existence. If we took it down to the core reasons, why are you making your change? And we found we could summarize it into about four different categories. Either yes, cost is really important. So either you're making income generation or cost reduction. But equally, there are probably some really core non-financial reasons why you're making your change. It could be to make members happier um, or reduce risk. And this will be different for all organisations. This is just we've, the model we found fits us. And then on the next slide, it seems a really simple model. So we map the, we write down all the work at the bottom, um, the capabilities that are being delivered by teams and the changes they're working on. And then the next step on to particularly, are they the only people who are delivering that change, who are responsible for the value, or do they need any other teams to get involved to really exploit that value and unlock it? And we found this was a real, um, a, a real step that was often missing because we found that um, often there were multiple teams claiming the same benefits and they just didn't have the dialogue across each other. So let's just put it on one map and on one screen, um, what teams are involved in delivering that end value. And then on the next slide, I'm sure you'll all recognize this bit um, about, so how does the work, what um, results in those leading metrics? So what are the metrics you can focus on that will give you fast feedback? Often we, and we still find that a lot of the focus is on the lagging metrics at the top. So almost like a business case, um, business case type attitude, which is great and it's really important, but equally it doesn't tell you the whole story and often the changes or the lack of changes come one or two years later, so you can't do anything about them. So these leading metrics, really important. How do we get fast feedback that things are going right or wrong? Things like number of complaints, for example. And then another thing, another step here that we often skip over. So are there any, not just what's in the boxes, um, and what value you're delivering, but are you are you making any assumptions along the way and on across the lines? So are you assuming that your leading metrics are resulting in change in improving your lagging metrics? For example, if you had a change about that you could make all your mortgage consultations via video conferencing, have you checked with the members to double check that they actually want that or not? And it's you could do things like experimentation, like Mark was talking about, to just test that early enough so that it doesn't cause you problems later down the line when you've suddenly got 100 video conferencing mortgage consultants. And then the other um, benefit that this approach has is that it leads you to ask the right questions. It's not just a business case. It leads you to ask things like, is there a genuine demand pool from my customers? So if my if, my, if our members in Nationwide saw this, would they agree that it's the right um, change that they'd be making or from your internal business areas? Um, are you delivering value fast enough or are you delivering it incrementally? Are you, or are you waiting till the end of your story until all the value hits? So. Um, some more information we can ask. And then on the next slide. So writing down that value story in itself and just working through it with the teams was really valuable and particularly asking the right questions. But equally, it was important that it didn't stop just it. It's not a business case. It's about focusing on value throughout the life cycle. So talk about your value story. Often we found that just talking about the value was much more important than writing it down. It wasn't about reporting. It's about making sure everybody in that whole thread um, understands why they're there and understands how they're going to get fast feedback. Agree how you'll measure your value. Otherwise, you can't. Um, you won't know whether you're going, whether it's going right or wrong. You won't be able to course correct. And then the next bit. Um, testing those high risk assumptions. If you work through the changes, you can often spot the things that you don't know early enough and you can spot which of those assumptions you're making a high risk. So check whether there's any low effort way of, of um, testing those or experimenting on those early to get early enough to give you insight. 
and then then down to the agree your objectives making sure they've got that golden thread that visible link to what value you're getting and your strategy and last but not least and i kind of think it's the most important um, tracking your measures across and then course correcting as we go because so it's all in that leading metrics if you if you're tracking your leading metrics you'll get early insight as to what where you can change and um, where you can improve without waiting for the business case to tell you that you haven't delivered two years later and then on to the last slide um, and, and then an important thing, I won't go into this in detail, but an important thing that we set up was it's not just about making the changes in the teams, but making the changes across the organisation as well. So you need to make sure that the organisation is ready to accept course correction, um, set it up in a way that the business own your objectives and they're not separate from the change teams. So if anyone else is trying to tackle the same problem, we've got some ideas that um, we found were really helpful in how you could create that value focused environment. I'll hand over to Mark and Zolt. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Mark and I um, work as part of the, the Measurement and Insight product uh, at Nationwide. So um, what I'm gonna do now over the, the next couple of minutes is really take you on a journey right back to um, the start, the end of uh, 2019 um, and show you kind of what we've been trying to deliver over, over, that, over that time. Because as we all know, um, quite a lot can change in a year. Um, and that has definitely been the case for, for us in the product team. So uh, if you can cast your mind back to Q4 of 2019, where 90% um, of us were probably sat in an office, um, you know, building out, you know, working in an agile uh, methodology, you know, having our daily standups, uh, but we put all of our kind of tickets on, on whiteboards. Um, so at a, a team level, you can get your manual reports out in terms of your lead time, uh, your flow efficiency, etc. cetera. Um, but as time went on, uh, we started to think about, um, you know, what, what we could, what could we do to utilize the data that we, that we have at, at Nationwide, where we started to implement tools like Jira, we have ServiceNow. So we wanted to kind of link our, our delivery um, kind of build with our uh, production releases. So uh, if we move forward a little bit in time, uh, coming towards the start of 2020, um, a few of us across, across Nationwide built up from people from the data analytics community, uh, the ways of working community got together and we, we put our heads together and we ultimately come out, we said, right, we, we need a product. Now, um, we could have kind of gone off and, and looked in the market, kind of an off the shelf tool. Uh, but what we decided to do was utilize our internal capability and, and the great people that we have at, at, at Nationwide. So um, yes, we decided to do so. We, what we started to do was we, we started in a very um, kind of startup way of working. We wanted to show value very quickly, um, get insight out to out to users and then invite those um, early adopters to kind of come along. So if we move forward a little bit more, uh, coming into, into Q2 of 2020, um, this is one of the patterns from the book that you will be very familiar with. Um, we didn't want to kind of push this onto people. Uh, we wanted to invite over inflict. Um, so we, what we started to do is we run uh, show and tells. So we had a, a bi-weekly show and tell where uh, we would start to invite our users to do the show and tells, you know, and prove that social proof. So you can kind of overcome those, um, you know, as laggards that uh, Tony was with, all those skeptics. You want to kind of start to get them on board. And what we started to see was those early adopters, those innovators that really kind of want to get into the detail, uh, very familiar with data. Uh, we started to see that, you know, there's the number of users start to increase over time. Now, as we come towards the end of, um, you know, the year into going into, into Q3, uh, well, yep. So what we can start to see is we're starting to unlock our measurability of flow now. So what we've done in this time, we've, we've taken data from our source systems like Jira. We've linked that into the change referenced information in, in ServiceNow. And what we can start to do is bring out some very key measures around, around BVSSH, which, which is what we'll go into in, in a second. Uh, and we're starting to show teams their, their flow efficiency uh, or how long it takes for pieces of work to go into progress and now how long that goes out to benefit our members via into production. 
Um, and now towards the end of um, end of Q4, uh, we're starting to see we're, we're crossing the chasm. So we're going into those early adopters or those, you know, those um, those, those early uh, majority. And I'll come on to the, a bit more of this in detail in, in a second. But uh, this ultimately resulted in us being um, finalists for the digital transformation product of the year. So, you know, where we kind of gone working from home, it's kind of forced our hand to be a bit more kind of digital using using technology and data. Um, and it's it kind of pushed our hand. So, you know, we got the product now, we, we're kind of getting it out to users. And uh, in, and as we come into the, into Q1 of 2021, at the end of our, our journey up to date, we now have over uh, 600 users at multiple levels of the society. Um, we have C-suite, um, you know, there's a screenshot there of a, of a monthly scorecard that we send out to our, our C-suite um, to give them uh, insight into the different BVSSH uh, metrics that uh, we provide yeah. as part of the product. But what we do is what's really key is we give an example of um, a use case. So we would look or work with a team in the society and pull out those insights that are really important to the journey that those individual teams have gone on, but include that in, in the packs that go out to C-suite to kind of see, um, you know, how, um, you know, the data is being used and those different insights are being shared um, across society. So as you can see, a lot can change in a year, um, but we're not stopping there. So um, as we come on to the, the next slide, please, Mark, um, you'll be familiar with the, you know, the innovation curve. Uh, Tony went through this uh, briefly. Um, you can start to see this is on the right hand side here. This is our users uh, that are using our our pin boards in in Fort Spot. Um, so you can start to see that that nice S curve that's starting to shape uh, over the year that we've gone on. So um, yeah, I, I'd just like to um, in, invite Jolt to give a bit more insight into some of the measures and the metrics that we are providing as as part of the product. Thank you so much, Mark. My name is Jolt Barand. And I would like to start that this brilliant journey wouldn't be possible without um, the leadership or leadership to, to sponsor this, to, to be having that mindset that we can we can actually run a product in a startup way. Uh, we can do invite over inflict, we can we can experiment and all that great stuff. Um, it's it's just um, make a, a leader our leaders make it or break it. Um, so it happened in our case, which is which is a brilliant journey. So Mark, if you could move to the next slide, please. Uh, so it made it possible as, as, as throughout the journey with, um, with experimenting to, to build more and more of our services as a product um, and unlocked measurability around a BV SSH uh, outcomes where the first one would be the quality, which is, um, if you move Mark to, to the next, yeah, so quality, which is what is our uh, quality of our products and services, um, incidents in production, change failure rate and others. Uh, then value, value which uh, Kim talked a lot about, um, measured by uh, OKRs, objectives and key results, uh, leading and lagging indicators. So what we, pro we provide in this case, because it's bespoke to the particular product, it's bespoke to the particular service, as you've seen, uh, but what we provide is the golden thread information. So what is the, what is the um, alignment, what is the percentage of work? aligned to the top of the portfolio, to the top of the, you know, to the, to the OKRs and the, and the outcomes. So, so that provides that transparency. Um, then sooner, so uh, the, we, we actually connect. So we provide the end-to-end, end-to-end uh, -end measurability of lead time. So this is, this is um, a, a, what we witnessed, what we experienced that is actually beyond the measure is even more important to have those conversations to unlock the measurability because it leads to many good positive behavior pattern change around, for example, that teams are starting using a board which is reflecting how they worked, whether it's a silo or whether, whether there are many handoffs. So just to make it visible, to create the transparency, also connecting the work with actually with change in production so that uh, creating the transparency and traceability Making, making visible the matter, so reducing, reducing the dark matter of uh, the unseen um, work um, in, the, in, the, um, in the flow of work. So measuring lead time throughput flow efficiency um, is in our service. 
that Matt talked about um, the um, speed and control. So not only speed, but speed and control. So measurability around uh, compliance and risk uh, and compliance colleagues and their engagement and uh, the risk stories. So having a dashboard there. And then Happier, which is uh, probably the most important after all, because happier colleagues lead to happier, happier customer. So we are running uh, a survey, which is a ways of working survey, and there are many, many other first check. Um, this particular one is around a comparison-based survey. So we are asking colleagues uh, to rate how they feel about ways of working compared to how it was uh, six months ago or the last time we ran, we ran the survey. And then, then we get real insights and th those insights are driving the strategy and driving the outcomes um, for the for the enablement specialist and the ways of working uh, teams where help is needed. So thank you so much uh, for listening and probably we should I hand it over back to you Nava. Okay, sure. So uh, thank you all. Um, there are many questions actually. Some of them got some answers. Maybe let's go through throughout those who didn't get answers uh, yet. So uh, I have a question for you, Mel, uh, by Steve. I'd love to know what structures or frameworks are in use for uh, ways of working nationwide. Was anything borrowed, brought, or is it being bootstrapped internally? Is there a playbook for something like risk assessment to make, uh, to make it, sorry, systematic or repeatable? Yes, so um, we built the unified risk assessment from scratch, so we, we didn't use any, um, any existing framework, um, but the risk assessments that have been put into the unified risk assessment um, are very much uh, lift and shift um, and we're at, at currently, but we're looking to develop those out um, as we develop the approach. Um, actually, it's quite interesting because we've only just had a conversation today around documenting our current processes and how we've got to where we've got to today and what we're producing um, because today it's very much been just produce this and get on and get, get on and do it um, but we need to now start um, looking at how we scale this and become a permanent bigger way of working across the society so we are looking at documenting um, those processes and, and producing um, something along those lines so definitely in the pipeline. All right, thank you, Mel. Um, well, I, I, I see a lot of answers coming, but uh, I will I will co uh, keep those I have in mind. Uh, I do have a question for you, uh, Tony. Um, you talked about the leaders and my question was, what did you do to prepare leaders for new ways of working? Uh I think for the preparation stage, I might have to hand over to Peter because I wasn't around. Um, I think okay. Peter, for the early days, might be in a better position to answer. Yeah, so um, it's a really good question. I can't tell you that there's a magic wand that you can wave and get everybody on board. Um, it's patience and nudging is the way that we're doing it. You know, it's great that we've got really strong sponsorship from Patrick Eltridge, our chief operating officer. Um, but you know, Patrick can't make his peer group change overnight. It, it is social proof, show that you can do this stuff, show the results that you get from it, and just gently nudge people along. It's, it's, it's the only way. I'm afraid there isn't a magic trick that we've learned yet. Andrews, I, I do have a question for you because I had a look on your LinkedIn profile. You started as a project manager and then you switched it to product manager, right? Yeah. How did you do? How, how did you go throughout this change yourself, Peter? Uh, so so I, I know I'm safe because we're on a Zoom call, but you know I spent a lot of my early career switching off agile projects because they were an utter disaster and switching them into waterfall things to make them safer. <laughs> What I've learned is that, that actually you need a team that believes that they can work in a different way. And we've got some great examples at Nationwide now, but it only happens when everybody wants to play the same game. So I've become convinced having worked in a number of organizations that have become so cumbersome in their planning approaches that they were just constantly failing. You know, the deterministic planning approach meant that the minute you'd finished the plan, it was instantly out of date. 
and trying to map complex dependencies all across the, the entire organization just resulted in a very fragile, brittle plan that broke the minute anybody coughed. So you know, realized that actually we, we were working on stuff, particularly in nationwide, because we have a very low risk appetite. We believed that planning would save everything. Planning actually made the problems worse. Getting value out earlier was the thing that unlocked it for me. Understanding what is value and how can you unlock value at the earliest possible opportunity, that was the big step forward for me, which made me more, gave me the belief that actually working in an agile way can work. Interesting. Interesting. All right, I see a lot of things happening on the chat. Um, uh, there is a, a question to, to Mark and Zolt by Eleno. Uh, it's only with me, but sometimes you fall in, in anxiety when you try to make a change on the process to focus on flow and focus. And the upper management don't believe on flow oriented way of working. So um, I guess it's um, what Peter said, it's the social proof is the key. So um, um, the scene is, uh, uh, again and again that the social proof is created, then the early majority gonna come and join. Um, if it is proven that actually focusing on flow, improving the flow, um, kind of bring um, real good benefits. So if if it's if it's so what we do is actually we are asking um, the the teams who started using our product to come and come on the show and tell and show how they use it and what are the benefits of using it, instead of us talking about it uh, all the time. So it's, it's, it's spreading and, and, and sharing and learning, connecting um, teams with each other and showing the social proof that what worked. Yeah, and, and I think RJ literally just said in the chat, um, you'll always get early adopters. So it's about working with those, proving value. And as, as Joel mentioned, using that as social proof and the kind of natural um kind of you know natural wanting to get involved natural curiosity of you see it on someone else's screen you want you want to see that as well so that's how you kind of get people on board i, th I think i'll probably add to that that i mean flow became a popular sort of fomo fear of missing out thing for a while we were very lucky that um, some very senior leaders embraced this idea and, and, and put it out there and that created a kind of curiosity about it so I think there was generally a pull thanks to some sort of senior sponsorship and uh, uh, Jolt has this uh, Flow 101 course that I uh, had the pleasure of sort of teaching with him sometimes and uh, the signups for that are just huge because pe the people want to get started um, and, and you know, Flow, they, they understand this is a currency for uh, for success and and doing the thing which is uh, is getting some attention. So, um, you know, that sponsorship has really helped and created a sort of movement Interesting. All right. Um, yeah, so, since you are talking, uh, Mark, um, there is one poke by Elino to you um, saying that I think that all experiments should have an EVP approach to consider investment. Not, not um, sure. do you, not would you like to explain that? Hmm? I don't know. Do you want to elaborate on the question a bit, Helena? Sorry, I don't know uh, EVP as an acronym. Yeah, that's a good question. I was wondering the same. Uh, let me see if if Elena posted something. Yes, uh, it's a fact for investment uh, that uh, it could have an even early value uh, approach of the information, uh, how much you pay to get the information earlier or how much you invest on the experiment that you would do. Uh, so the EVP approach is about investment, is about when you will beat your money to make this investment. So I think that uh, when you are doing or you are dealing with investments, you could use this kind of approach or think on how you, when you beat your money on the experiment. 
I, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I mean, I kind of something that's similar to sort of what I was typing in the chat. Um, we, you know, we we put a value on information. I mean, we are trying to improve a um, complex system with 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 its ways of working. So, um, you know, it's, it really is the domain of the of the work that we're doing. But um, yeah, we we have to award a value to information, and then that has to factor into our prioritization process. So yeah, totally agree. Right. Um, I think we we should uh, we should end things here. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, it's amazing. And again, the, the session was recorded, uh, so for those who need to uh, listen to it again, we'll be happy to share. I also wanted to uh, to ask you to stay tuned because we will be having uh, a next event on May the sixth. Uh, which will be dedicated to Agile for Marketing. Um, so we'll, you will see the posting soon. And yeah, uh, thank you all um, and enjoy your afternoon or evening and, uh, and hopefully talk to you and see you very soon.